Hi, everyone. Thank you so much um, for tuning in. Um, I was looking at the participants list and I had to shut it down because you're making me nervous. There's so many of my friends and colleagues uh, and people whose work I admire who are here. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to start also by thanking Professor Mabel Wilson for this invitation. Thank you to Sharon Harris for making it all work well. And thank you so much to Natasha Lightfoot for being my interlocutor. Um, we have a little bit of NYU in the house here uh, between Natasha and Mabel and myself, although I'm a, I'm a latecomer to NYU. Um, I also, before I get started, really want to extend my deepest, deepest sympathies to everyone at the Institute for Research in African American Studies and at Columbia writ large at the shocking loss of Dr. Stephen Gregory. Um, his work as a scholar and a mentor is so crucial to the fields of anthropology, to urban studies, African American diaspora studies. Um, I knew him briefly at NYU, but I saw him frequently around the Columbia neighborhood and I was always so struck by his generosity of spirit. Um, I know he will be deeply missed and really powerfully mourned. So um, I just wanted to start with that. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna read the preface uh, of, of the book, um, and which is short, uh, and then talk about it for just a minute before um, I, I brace myself for a conversation with Professor Lightfoot. Um, okay, so the, the preface of the book references the cover whoop, uh, the cover of the book and this painting. So I'm about to talk about this painting, which maybe you've seen also in the in the um, the advertisement for the talk. So sometime in the years before 1585, in the town of Bologna, Italy, the woman on the cover of this book sat for a portrait painted by a man who would become famous. I won't give you his name because it's not important to the story that I'm trying to tell. I can't tell you hers, although her anonymity is at the very heart of the story that I'm trying to tell. As you can see in the portrait, um, she is well-dressed and she holds an ornate clock that may indicate the kind of wealthy household she was a part of. The painting was damaged, so we do not know who else was in the portrait, only that at one point she was not alone. If you look closely at the bodice of her gown, you will see straight pins. She may or may not have sewed the dress um, and the decorative collar that she wears. She may or may not have been a seamstress. She may or may not have been paid for her labor. She may or may not have been free. Hundreds of Africans, both enslaved and free, were in Italy at the end of the 16th century. At the time when the woman was painted, the legality of African enslavability had circulated around the Mediterranean for almost 150 years. But art historians don't know who this woman is. They can't. Black woman with a clock, slave woman with a clock, African woman with a clock. She marks time with the object that she holds, but she marks so much more with the gaze that holds us. Her visage conveys nothing if not knowing. She knows who she is in relation to the painter. She knows what she sees. She locks eyes with her viewers and comes close to dismissing us with the turn of her lip, dismissing perhaps our questions about who she is. When I look at her, I see someone who understands her own value, both the value that can't be quantified and that which can. I see a woman who reaches out across the centuries to say, look at me and see what brought me here. And what follows is my effort to do so. So I wrote that as one does um, at the very, very end of the publication process. And I wrote it in an effort, I think, to capture the methodological challenges and the, the tension uh, that I feel in the archives of early modern slavery. Um, as I listen to it now, I, I find it evocative, um, but I also find uh, it as an effort to convey something that I can't quite see and that I can't quite name. That opacity is what drew me to this project, a project that considers the unfolding of early modern capitalism through the eyes, through the prism of women like her. There is an association, um, I think, in the past between enslaved women and the kind of earthy loam of social history that is hard to shake. A presumption that a study of gender and slavery is by default a study of affect, 
of pain, of resilience, of the minute pleasures of movement, or um, the insistence that one's child was one's own, um, or the terror of the auction block, the degradation of a mistress's violence in her chamber pot, the toll taken on the body by the frenzied harvest of sugarcane or the incessant pounding of rice. These are all real, no doubt, but there is something missing from the production of these women in our historical memory. Um, and it's a large gap. Uh, it's, it's a large gap in which that woman, that unnamed woman, might be found. But to find her, we need to turn to a range of sources that are literally designed to keep her obscure. The accounts of so-called travelers, the edicts of royal rulers declaring their lands to be no home to blackamoors, the works of decorative art that mobilize those very men and women to outline the status and fashion of Europeans, who are increasingly seeing their worth as tied to the lightness of their skin. For some historians, those, those sources are so powerful that they convince us that we cannot do this work, that we cannot bring that woman into focus um, because that, lo lo sorry, that loamy earthiness um, that we need to access a social history feels so utterly missing from the account books and the ledgers and the inventories and the bills of sale in which we are so much more likely to find her and her sister. My interest though lies in the accumulated knowledge that women like her brought to the economic and social systems that were built around and through their presence. The records of the slave trade and of the commerce that are at its heart are part of a technology of knowledge production that situates trade and racial slavery as rational and that excludes women's lives from the purview of the archive. Their absence is important because it enables a myth whereby slavery is legitimate and not muddied by the presence of grieving mothers or women who have feelings and thoughts and ideology and politics. Um, women as producers and reproducers have been at the heart of Atlantic slavery from its inception. But I think what I'm arguing, at least one of the things that I'm arguing that I have argued in laboring women and that I've elaborated on in this, in this work is that um, they bring the capacity to birth the wealth that is associated with a slave trade brings with it a critical comprehension of the depth of violence that's embedded in hereditary racial slavery. I'm arguing here and throughout the work that this clarity of awareness is at the heart of what we are currently thinking of as racial capitalism, and that the erasure of these women's critical understanding of what was being wrought through their bodies is a key and profoundly under theorized aspect of the history of the Black Atlantic. Racial capitalism, of course, is the argument that the roots of capitalism are inextricable from those of slavery and that the inequities of slavery actually are the fertile ground for the appropriation of value that follows. So the gaze of this woman from Bologna in 1585, I am convinced, conveys all of that and more. It conveys her own awareness of how she's being positioned and the painter's ability to capture her knowingness is a provocation to me to ask what it is precisely that she might know. So this is a methodological stance of sorts. It's one that enables me to articulate that she and the other women who are at the heart of my work must also be at the heart of social historical investigations into what positions economics as the site of rationality and knowability. The process by which accounts of court and trade and commerce and government came to be archived is the same process that ends with no accounting at all for the lived experiences of most Africans as commodities of the lives of 17th century African women and their descendants. We know, uh, I'm sure everyone on this webinar and, um, and all of us who, um, who are working in this area, that it is impossible to approach the histories of slavery and gender without confronting the problem of the archive. Um, uh, but having said that, I believe that all manner of questions and presumably answers are revealed when we center the lives of African women and their descendants in our archival um, efforts. So discerning the contours of those lives from the fragments of the archives is challenging, um, and it requires a methodological stance in which a painting, and the woman in that painting, um, provokes a ledger, and the woman who is enumerated in the ledger. 
archival fragments and lingering with them in the gaze of the woman in this painting bring me close to the reckoning that I believe we must all complete as we attempt to navigate the afterlives of slavery and the weighty violence of racial capitalism. So that is where I will leave it. Um, so thank you so much for that reading and the, you know, sort of provocation that you followed up with. Um, I just wanted to start my comments by saying that the book is such a welcome historical intervention um, in how we understand the slave trade. Um, not only because it gets us to think anew about the, the contours of the trade, but also that it's doing so by literally stating the obvious about the relationships between blackness, gender, and the economy of slave trading that so many literate observers in the time of the trade, as well as many scholars in the present era who retell this history have somehow long ignored. Um, and that kind of ignoring the obvious for so long that it made everything else about the history of the slave trade seem rational, except black people's sense of what was happening to them while they were in it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that work of, that you've done of returning our eyes to what was always before us is so crucial. It's such important work for scholars of the diaspora and really scholars of the trade and the so-called modern West, right? Um, the economic historians just don't tell the story in this way, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think you're engaging with that in some, you know, that, that sort of like that blockage um, in that field in, a, in, in really important, um, you know, kinds of, of you know, in, in, in important kinds of ways. And I kind of, I guess the first question I wanted to ask because so much of this for me strikes me as, um, you know, more than many other um, sort of second books, this is a real kind of, there's a real call and response sort of character going on between what you started um, in terms of a conversation in laboring women um, and what's happening here um, where you expand on questions about data and, you know, kind of exactly how do you think the two books are really talking to each other? Because I, I would love to hear you think about aloud on that. Okay, thank you. So, so I agree that this, so when I finished laboring women and, and I, I felt like, I, I feel like that's, that really is an effort to do a social historical project, right? But one of the, one of the um, lessons that I learned as a graduate student was that you always start social historical projects with a little demographic overview, like who is there and how many people are there and how many men and how many women and how many children. You kind of establish the lay of the land of wherever it is that you're gonna study. And I, was immediately frustrated by the ways in which the demographic data or the economic data, which at, at the, the time that I finished that book, the um, transatlantic slave trade database was just sort of coming together and was circulating. Um, and, I, and I found myself very frustrated by both the gesture that those numbers were, um, were uh, clear right, that they conveyed clear information and that that should be a starting point. So I realized that what I, what I now would describe that is, is that I was really trying to, to challenge the empiricists to say like, we can't, it's not, that, it's not that we can't rely on demographic data or we can't rely on the numbers that we now understand are helping us to comprehend the slave trade, but what we have to understand is that the mechanisms by which that demographic data comes into being are inextricable from the development of the slave trade, right? That the very, that conversations that are happening um, throughout Europe, um, changes that are being made to the ways in which people think about value both in Europe and on the African coast are being transformed by this thing that is happening, which is slavery and colonial occupation of, 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 the, of the Americas, right? And so if that's the case, I guess I want to kind of to say, so, so what is this business of knowing, right? And, and that led me sort of surprisingly, I think this wasn't what I had intended to do, but that led me more surprisingly into this question of what is it that, why is it that we presume that African captives 
don't know anything, right? Like that there's a, and, and I know, and we all know the historiography of that, that moment where we are trying to capture the violence of what happens on the Middle Passage. You're trying to capture the violence of the, of the plantation. But I started to feel, I think I'm influenced a little bit by Nell Painter's work in this regard, that, um, that by, by focusing there, we forget that people are, they have an analytic, they have a perspective on, on what value means. They understand markets. So they understand the violence that's being done to themselves when they are marketed. And especially people who can produce children for that market are, are positioned in such a way, I think, to know something. And I, and I don't know, I, I don't know exactly what they know, but I think that that has to be at the heart of the question. And I don't think I asked that question very explicitly in Laboring Women. Um, and I think that I wanted the end of your question. Um, Natasha, you said like, this is something that we need to think about as scholars of slavery, but also as scholars of the modern West, right? And, and obviously I'm writing at a moment when so much important scholarship has been produced about the connection, the structural connection between slavery and the slave trade and the emergence of Western capitalism and you know large scale, transatlantic and transcontinental um, trade networks. So all of those things are together. And obviously, the people who are captured by it, enmeshed in it, um, are, are seeing something happening, even if they don't obviously have the language that we have to describe it. Um, and I, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's certainly part of what, what moved me from laboring women to reckoning with slavery. Definitely. Um, it's a great answer to the question. It actually leads into something else I wanted to ask you about this, um, this work that you're doing to push back against the sort of the siloing of the history of the slave trade, mm -hmm. um, as, you know, that's kind of a social history versus the, demog the demographic and kind of financialized history yes. of the yes. slave trade as being sort of two wholly separate exactly. um, mutually exclusive categories. And I was really struck by also how um, early in the book, you note that there's something very racialized about this siloing, um, because I was, I was in particular, um, you know, you note on, um, in, you know, at one point you note that there is a way that kind of quantification in the trade is supposedly rationalizing the discussion of the trade and refuting, um, you know, the mafia, right? And this idea that the more exaggerated the numbers of who you think were sort of absorbed into the trade, the more kind of, um, you know, the more uh, effective <laughs> the, the sort of the theorizing becomes. Um, and then you also, and you, and you also raised um, Eric Williams uh, a little bit further on about, and, and kind of noting the fact that he was so very um, quickly dismissed and for such a long time by the field mm -hmm. um, and, and how capitalism and slavery was positioned as a polemic and what the effects were of his dismissal on the field. So I wanted you to definitely talk a bit more about what you see as sort of what's happening here, both because there's something going on, obviously, with the siloing of the two parts of the slave trade, but something else that's happening in terms of who gets to say what in the field that I think you're also asking some questions about that are right. Really I mean, absolutely. I think that there is a, there is a, um, there's still a lot of work to be done to think about the kind of um, the intellectual history of, of this field, right? And who gets to be, uh, whose work is, is shunted aside and whose work is centralized at different moments in time. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, that I, that I think in that discussion about, about MAFA and about like, the way so that's that discussion happens when I'm sort of walking us through the historiography of the scope of the trade, right? The the sort of the the conversation that begins with uh, W. B. Du Bois, but that's taken up by Philip Curtin um, and is then uh, circulated around like the literally the numbers of people, right? Um, and one of the thing, if I feel like when you read debates that are about demography, and often those might not be the most interesting debates, but I think that in the case of the slave trade, those debates kind of are massively amplified, right? Um, 
that those debates about demography show you just how uh, embedded in affect those numerical claims are, right? So that if you agree with, with Curtin and with the, 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 the economic historians um, who are quantifying the slave trade about the number of 12 million and uh, you know approximately 12 million with a you know, with a with an approximate 20 percent mortality rate um, that feels rational if you agree with people who are associated uh, who with a kind of, of radical Afrocentrism, um, that the numbers are bigger, uh, that the numbers, that there are too, there's too much death that happens on the other side for us to, to account for, then somehow that becomes polemic, that becomes political. Um, and I think that the misreading of um, Eric Williams' work, the decades long misreading that um, from my experience really starts to get readjusted uh, by Colin Palmer's amazing introduction to a reissued uh, volume of uh, capital, cap, uh, it's on my shelf right here. Um, uh, Capitalism and slavery. But it's Chapel, no, I was trying, it's Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill one in Chapel Hill. Exactly, right. exactly. And, and in which he talks about, he, he lays out that historiography. And, and of course now you cannot, you can't, you know, you can't engage in um, scholarship on the history of the slave trade without centering Eric Williams. Like it's just not possible. And of course, if you connect that to the work, for example, that you and I both know very well, of uh, the, um, the Legacies of Slave Ownership Database, the project out of University uh, UCL in London, um, the clear impact that the massive payout to slave owners that the state engages in, uh, in the 1830s, um, the, the idea that somehow it's absurd to imagine that the, that the economic um, impact of slavery was marginal. Uh, it just, the, the evidence is overwhelming that there's a politics in diminishing numbers and there's a politics in elaborating numbers. And if we start from there, I think we get to see we, we see the ways in which race gets deployed um, to make some scholarship seem irrational and some scholarship seem rational. Yeah. And luckily, I think we're at a moment now, um, you know, where, where there's a, a broad collective agreement that we need to take we need to revisit these questions. We need to think seriously about the, about that would, and you know, Cedric Robinson, we need to think about uh, racial capitalism. We need to think about what the relationships are between these two um, economic systems so that we can uh, also understand racial systems. Um, so I stick a pin in that because I will, I do want to bring back up Cedric Robinson. Um, <laughs> Um, but I did want to pivot to that sort of the centrality of kinship um, in the book um, because it does such important theoretical work throughout the text. Um, so I wanted you to speak at length about arguments on African forms of kinship being both comprehensible and yet rendered illegible by Europeans who are engineering the trade and narrating themselves within the, the trade, right? Mm -hmm. And how that narration sort of works as an act of producing race conceptually via these gendered mathematical understandings of black women's kind of physicality, the projections of their fertility, and yet all of the sort of adding up to their inhumanity, right? So one of the other ways that I think the work in laboring women kind of speaks to this project is that I realized, um, I went back to the, the travel narratives that I had used to talk about the kind of image of African women's bodies as being sort of reproductively um, uh, accessible to the slave trade, right? Like that, that so that that um, that article that in the first chapter of Laboring Women, in which I talk about the the sort of monstrosity of the way that Europeans talk about African women. What I realized is that there was a whole discussion of trade and rationality and 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 um, uh, I just lost the word for money, like um, currency. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> currency. 
currency, um, that there's a whole discussion about trade and currency and rationality that happens in the same uh, in the same documents, in the same narrative descriptions of African women giving birth without pain or breastfeeding their children with a breast slung over their shoulder. Like they're they're close. And but I had not, you know, I wasn't interested in debates about the value of shells or cloth or gold because I was looking for women. But what I failed to see in that first go round is that women are are like placeholders for a kind of assertion that Africans don't understand value. And that that too is part of the edifice that's being constructed in those travel narratives and by early, by some early modern traders, right? So, and, and when it comes to this notion about value, you see, I mean, the people who are observing this and who are writing it for us, for European re readers, um, are, are both, engaged in complex exchanges with African traders, while at the same time mounting arguments that Africans could not understand value. And that's another example of like the proximity of the rational and the irrational. They're right, they're right up against each other. And, and the one that wins is the one that the person in power can mobilize in order to rationalize the entirely irrational thing that he is doing, which is building his wealth through capturing other human beings and selling them in marketplaces. And so one of the stories that I come back to again and again is um, Azurada, who's a Portuguese chronicler, Azurada's description of this um, exposure of the what I what I believe to be the first kind of large group of African captives who were sold um, in in Portugal, right? It's 1444, and he writes with some you know affect and clarity about the the sadness that the captives are feeling at being separated, and he talks about the moment he uses the language of mathematics to say it was the time for the division of the cargo, the division of the captives and, and men and women and siblings and children and parents were being separated from one another into these rational kind of packets to be sold. And those people were refusing that and were we, you know, and he talks about mothers holding their children and, you know, cowering to try to protect their children from being taken from them. And he says, you know, we cannot, we could not understand the words of their language, but we could understand their grief, right? And that paragraph is a, is a, I use to say there is something that, that, that the, that the violence of the marketplace and the evidence of kinship are, are right next to each other. And then what Zurara does is he goes on in the same uh, document to talk about how the most important thing is the smile on the prince's face when captive Africans are delivered to him so that he knows that there could be more, right? So, and that the evidence, and then, and there is description after description of ways in which the Portuguese are capturing African people on the coast of Senegambia. And that's the, that trumps the knowledge of their grief, right? And, and so, and yet, so he says it, but then he moves to this other space. And again, it's about the construction of, of claims of the rational claims of what the market does that is so like interesting to me and also a place of such like profound horror and dismay. Exactly, I think it's really important that, you know, the sort of idea that European political arithmetic, as you put it, um, is essentially violent mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and you know that there is that almost all of the other kinds of violences that spring forth from the slave trade in many ways are kind of built from the grist of this calculus mm -hmm. that kind of it's, it's foundation yeah. yeah and I think that we you know we have um, we have the example like we I've also benefited enormously from the work of, of poets and of writers who are trying, who are not, who are not um, so like bound by uh, academic concerns um, to unpack the, that 
veneer of rationality. I'm thinking of Norbise Phillips' work on the Zong. Um, I'm thinking about Christina Sharp's work um, in the wake. I'm thinking about Diane, uh, uh, Dion Brand. I'm thinking about the artists and the, and the poets and the writers who are saying like, these numbers are doing violence. Like there's no, this is not like a new discussion, you know, a, a discovery on my part, but what I'm trying to do is say, okay, so what is the archival basis for that, that sleight of hand that imagines that there is no violence in counting people, but when, you know, we know that there's a violence there. And in fact, early modern, I mean, we have evidence that early modern English men are wealthy, are like, don't count me, Right, don't they don't? They're very um, the census as a as a tool is something that's emerging in the 17th century, and and wealthy English men are like, no, I don't, I don't want you in. Uh, you know, this is not exactly what happens, but like the metaphor is like, I don't want you in my house counting my family. Like, I'll tell you how rich I am. You can count the windows of my house, but you can't count my people. And there's a because there's a recognition that there's something violent that happens there even at the same moment that there that there are English theorists who are saying we need to know the numbers of the population right like so these two things are happening again in the middle of the 17th century as England is actively engaging in the slave trade and is using the slave trade as a means to bolster colonial settlement in the Americas in the Caribbean and, and North America I, all, I really appreciated that sort of idea of sort of who counts versus who gets counted. Mm -hmm. um, and that, so that framing for me was very kind of simple and illuminative about what's happening here as England is figuring out the extent of its own population and figuring out to how others can be counted toward profits for the, for the nation and the empire um, that's in, 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 in formation. Um, so, you know, part of the, the, your response raising the sort of the poets, um, the writers, the other theorists, I actually wanted to ask you about the kinds of theoretical foundations of the work. I feel like, you know, this work is incredible in terms of the breadth of reading that, you know, the text um, puts forth in terms of, you know, your thinking through and with, you know, gender theory, economic theory. Black studies, Black feminism. Um, it's all really quite impressive. Um, specifically, I feel like, you know, you're doing great work with the work of Spillers, of Cedric Robinson, of Hartman, Sharp, um, you know, Smallwood, Poovey, Butler, Winter, right? So many important theorists, um, you know, and, you know, the work that they're doing, you're engaging a really great effect. And I think, um, Thank you. Here, you know, here I wanted to raise Robinson um, because uh, that sort of sense that you had um, that in, at one point in the book, you say that the kind of the origins of black radicalism um, that he's raising sort of ties kinship as a counter narrative that illuminates mm -hmm. the alignments between mm -hmm. maternity and political economy. Mm -hmm. I love that turn. I also I'm thinking too of how you, again, to move, you know, through spillers and the work of, of her understanding of grammar. Um, and I th it was, I think, Ignatia Sancho's mother at one point mm -hmm. talked about her being unnamed, obscure, but then his literacy and his exposure becomes a kind of prominence for her mm -hmm. even in her unnamed positioning mm -hmm. and sort of that mm -hmm. embodies the grammar, the race as grammar again through gender. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to sort of have you maybe expound on any of that or other, other theorists, other sorts of texts that helped you come to what is a very specific kind of reading yeah. of the text that you are are putting forth here because it's not like anything I've seen in studies of the slave trade previously. Thank you, thank you so much for um, for those compliments and and I, I feel so I I said at the beginning that I feel like 
the gaze of the woman in the portrait is a methodological stance, right? Or that it, it, it produces in me, or it helps me to recognize a methodological stance. I mean, you know, I'm trained as a, as a colonial Americanist, right? And, and by historians, like I'm trained by historians, Julia Scott, Peter Wood, other historians. Um, but I have only ever taught in joint appointments. I've always been jointly appointed um, in history and then in interdisciplinary spaces, gender sexuality studies at Rutgers University, and then at NYU, um, social and cultural analysis, which is the home for Africana studies, gender sexuality studies, and, and other critical race um, and metropolitan studies. I, I have benefited, I think, so much from trying to struggle through a 16th and a 17th century archive with its gaps, with its elisions, with its silences, um, and having uh, the kind of theoretical breadth that my disciplinary location allowed, like my professional location allows me, you know, I, I feel like that is something that I don't know how I could have replicated, right? Um, and, and so I just wanted to sort of explain that. I read, you know, voraciously and widely because I'm looking for help. You know, I'm looking for ways to help me think through and to mount, because I need, I, I believe in the archive, right? Like I, I believe that I need to stay in the archive. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking through a new project right now, which I will not talk about, so don't ask me. Um, but I'm reading, you know, I'm reading 17th century law right now because I want to, you know, and I want to start there and then I want to go to back always to Hortense Spillers. I can't write a word without reading that article, um, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, every single time I learn something new about what the structures of economy and affect and, and, and race how they come into, into play. Um, I can't, uh, I need to think with and through. Um, so Cedric Robinson, who I encountered actually relatively late and I, but I kept on thinking about this. So for Robinson, the origins of black radicalism are in the maroon communities, right? Because they're in the place where runaways go to uh, restore that sense of ontological totality to say like, I can't figure out how to get back home from here. So I'm going to recreate home here, which I think is very powerful. And, but then I, but what's missing from Robinson is a is gender right is a is a and and what's missing from many studies of marinage is the fact that these are communities of men and women like women um, women are maroons women are not the plunder that maroons capture women are maroons um, and women are creating community in marinage and that felt like such an obvious omission. Um, but one that I was very grateful that I, you know, especially Robinson's those first, that first section of that book where I think a lot of people kind of are more interested in the, in the later piece. But for me, it's that stuff that starts in feudal Europe and says, what is the foundation for this, uh, this sense of human hierarchy and, and, and how do people respond to it? And so I wanted to kind of capture this possibility that an origin of black radicalism is in the woman who is trying to imagine a future in which her child might not be enslaved, right? And is trying to construct that by running away, by using the courts, by doing something, right? Um, and I think that that, you know, that is a, is a way, as a mode of thinking like that, that looking at a, at, a, at, a, at a law or, you know, the, the part of sequitur ventrum, the, the, the act and saying like, there is so much packed in here. And I learned that from literary critics. And I learned that from, from, from writers of fiction and from poets who parse enormous meaning in very small numbers of words, right? So I, I think that there, so it's, it's, meth, it's like a methodological, um, from promiscuity. <laughs>
it's it's open it's, it's sensibility <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. So with that said, interestingly, you know, you keep anticipating everything that I want to ask because you, I couldn't let the, a discussion like this go down without some questions about your archive um, because it's spectacular. It is broad ranging. It, it's so deeply problematic. It is so troubling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, you know, to use the term counted again Tell me exactly how you determine what counted as the best sources here to trace mm -hmm. diversity and African women's comprehension of themselves as counting or not in certain ways um, in the wake of what's happening in, of a violent process of commodification. Like, where do you see this? How did you, and what did you not engage um, mm -hmm. or engage maybe in certain kinds of moments in fleeting fashion? Because I did want to say, interestingly, I felt like you know, the Slave Voyages database, it's kind of just, it makes appearances and flashes that is not mm -hmm. something you are tied to. And I, and I think that that's something that is, again, distinct about how, you talking, uh, how you're talking about the slave trade versus how many other histories of the slave trade talk about the slave trade. They, they're very much grounded in that database in certain ways. So I would love to, you know, not just that, but obviously, but that plus, other questions about how you come to have the archive that you have. So one of the things that I, and I, and this will sound like I'm being like facetious, but it's actually really true. There is something very uh, comforting uh, and structuring about the, about, and disciplining about working in the time period that I'm working in, uh, on enslaved people, because the, the, there's not a massive capacious archive. Right. There's a there's a so when you say what counts, I mean, I I would simply, you know, I simply was trying to read everything that gets translated into English or is sold that's available to English booksellers that talks about Africa. Right. And and you, a researcher can do that. Um, I was trying to um, read you know, whatever I could find that was published or that circulated or that's archived that describes the slave trade or that describe the early part of the slave trade. Um, I, you know, in English, because that's another limitation to, to the, that's another kind of bracket around the work. Um, I think that, that that is also part of, you know, I'm not an, I don't, I'm, I'm very in awe of people who work in the 19th and the 20th century, because I feel like the, the amount, like the sift, the, the, the choices that you have to make to say like, okay, I'm going to stop reading here, or I'm going to, you know, those are really hard choices. And, and I don't feel like I, I come up against those quite as much. Do you see what I mean? I would also say that I think that the work that I do to critique the slave trade, the slave voyages database is of course entirely dependent on the fact that it exists, right? Like, so I don't want to suggest that that work is like incidental or unimportant. And I think that one of the really exciting things that's happening right now in the field is the way that um, both slave, mm, slavevoyages.org um, and other data sets are, are, are enabling us to search out data on Black lives in the 17th century, in the 16th century. Um, I think that, uh, that there's, a, a, I'm relying on that kind of data, even as I'm trying to critique it and make clear what its limits are, right? Um, and to suggest that there are, are other ways that we need to approach even something that's like the foundational question of how many people are, are there, right? That we need to, we need to um, be very, and I, you know, I think that, that historians, social historians of this, of, you know, 16th and 17th century Europe or the Americas, are very, I'm not saying something new. What I'm saying is that for people who are studying slavery, the presumption has been, we just need to go to the data set or we just need to go to the market, the records of the market. And part of what I wanna say is that the, that, that presumption that all people who are captured would be accounted for in the market is itself a construct of the, of the claims that, that the market is making. Um, so yeah, so so my archive is limited in part by my 
insistence on working in this early time period. Um, but I think, I mean, the minute I'm, this happens to everybody, the minute this book was published, I was like, gee, I, there's so many things that I didn't do. Like, why don't I read Spanish better? Why can't I work in, in the Latin American archives more like, I, it's a huge gap and there's a huge number of young scholars who are working on race and slavery in um, Spanish, in Spanish language sources, both in Iberia and in Latin America and the Caribbean. It's going to change the field. There's no question. There's so much more information about how many people are captured in the in the, literally the first decades of the slave trade um, that that is coming both from the scholars who are working to to elaborate the database, but are also coming from scholars who are working on the more social historical questions. So that's one thing. Um, I also feel like there's still a lot that I didn't get to around sort of English ideas about value. Like I, I, I feel like I was, what I hope is that the book is a provocation and that others will take up a more kind of deep dive, let's say, into West African markets in relationship to the to the Atlantic, um, or uh, a deep dive into like the London uh, commodity exchanges in relationship to human hierarchy, right? Like those questions, I think I, I gestured toward. I don't think that I answered. Uh, you know. Well, it's always good to be starting a conversation, and this always, is always good to be starting something. <laughs> exactly, it's, it's such a conversation starter. Um, so I think before opening it up, I just wanted to ask maybe, and you can engage this as you know, sort of, you know, with as much detail or as little as possible. But I do want to sort of acknowledge the fact that there is a certain kind of effective labor in writing this kind of work, um, especially you know, sort of being a black woman writing about black women in the trade in and, and experiencing these various sort of layers of violence. Um, mm -hmm. So I did want to just sort of have hear you speak a bit about what it is to write like this and you know kind of how you manage with the difficulty of constructing histories that mm -hmm. are so hard to to think about mm -hmm. constantly at the way that you have to, to produce a whole book. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that I, you know, I could say, I could say something flip and say, oh, that's why it took me so long to write it, right? Because like you need, you need breathing room, you know? Um, I, I think, I think when I, when I think about feeling, when I think about affect, I think about the, it's, I, I feel like what I'm always trying to do is to, is to like make a connection between these women whose stories are just literally like fragments, like um, the, I, I wrote in, in my, in the article in Small Acts on, uh, about, uh, about Pardis, I write about the woman Maria who is left on an, on an abandoned island because she's been impregnated by sailors aboard Hawkins. And it's like, it's literally two lines in the archive. And I just felt like the only thing that I can do is to just try to bring her back into our consciousness. Um, like every, you know what I mean? There's so much that's lost. There's so many people who have been lost. And, you know, we, I, like when I first heard the, um, the, the say their names, say their names, that chant of Black Lives Matter, um, I realized this is, I, please, nobody who's listening to this is allowed to misunderstand me right now what I'm about to say. I'm not, I'm not saying that the work of the historian is the same as the work of, of the activist, but I remember when I was doing the footnotes for laboring women that I turned that I, 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 if you read, like, if I have a, have a, a woman who's named in a will and there's a footnote to the will, I put her name first, like, Mary, comma, and then the name of the man who owned her and, and who, who wrote that will. I was like, no, I'm not going to. And I tried to never, not never, but I tried to almost never name the, the, the slave owner, right? I just wanted to, to name these women who were in, you know, who's only, and whose name might not have even been the name that they 
call themselves, right? But I was like, here's what I have. Let me let me say her name. And I did that in 2004 because there was something that I understood about what it meant to kind of resituate them, even in this really fragmented, broken way. Um, I think there's so much agony in the in the sources, but the agony is like it's it's easy to gloss. It's easy to miss if you don't sit with it. Like you have to sit with it to understand it, right? You have to sit with it to to see to 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 make the connection between that agony and the agony that we're all living surrounded by in 21st century racial capitalism, right? Like we. So I, I feel like it, it requires time and it requires also like the, the, the lessons learned by reading Toni Morrison as well as reading demographic theory, right? Like that you have to do both of those things, um, but it is, uh, it, is a, it is a painful uh, process and it's something that requires moments of breath. Well, Thank you so much, Jennifer, for your really um, sort of uh, comprehensive and, and thoughtful engagement of, you know, all of my inquiries. I, I feel really excited to go back and read the book again now with, you know, the sort of the guide that you provided um, here to all of us about how to think, um, you know, with and through your work. Thank um, you so much. So now I've, um, it's, you know, time to open it up to audience questions. Um, so Mabel, uh, you're back with us. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So thank you, Jennifer. Uh, that was great. And also Natasha for a really remarkable conversation, you know, probing, you know, deeper into the framework of the book um, and really what it offers us as a kind of model um, for exploring, you know, these difficult histories. Um, and, and I appreciate that last question, Natasha, about the sort of effective labor that's required to engage this work, again, which is never accounted for. Um, <laughs> at some point, because it's a lot. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lot. Um, and, and so I really appreciate that, that final question. So, you know, again, um, please feel free uh, if you have questions to, to put them in the Q&A um, and um, we'll get to them. Um, we have till about eight o'clock. So we do have some time for questions. And so I wanted to start, and also Natasha, feel free to chime in. Your work is also very much related, I think, to a lot of these questions. So I think the audience would love to hear also, you know, from your perspective and the work that you do. Um, so the question uh, I'm going to start with is from uh, Ana, Ana, Anjali Arandekar. Um, and that question is, can gendered kinship in the radical ways in which you historicize it destabilize the very idea of a calculus of racialized value. Um, and then it says beyond data interrelationality. Uh, and, uh, and, I'll, and, and Jolly says many thanks for your wonderful book. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I think that, uh, I think that part of, I, I think the short answer is yes, right? Like that, that part of what I'm trying to, um, to apprehend, to catch, to understand is the way that kinship is, is um, hereditary racial slavery is a, is, a, is a profound intrusion into the space that kinship is supposed to be, right? It means that as soon as the transatlantic slave trade commences in 1444, the market is like a, it's like a it's like a dagger through the family, right? It says, and the and the market allows slave traders to say, um, you know, Africans don't have ties of love and kinship and community, even as they were describing them. Um, but it also, if we turn that on its side, I think that there's something, um, and this is actually something that I've also learned by reading queer theory, right? That there's a way in which constructing kinship is a radical act, right? And is, and it, we recognize that um, many, I'm sure many of us, you know, 
talk about like the families that we create, et cetera, under, uh, you know, but this is, this is the origins of, of, of Black Atlantic life is a radical reconstruction of kinship that has been destroyed by them. It's been destroyed by the Middle Passage and then it's been destroyed by the, um, by the, um, by the market that happens and the labor regime that happens afterwards. And yet, and yet, and yet, and yet, people recreate kinship, people recreate community, they create language, they create, um, they, they create a kind of uh, an aspiration towards wholeness that is really powerful and very radical and is a, and I think pushes back very kind of intensely on the on the logics of, of of the market, which is the logics of capitalism, right? Yeah, the play cousin. Yeah. Sitting on the foundation of the Atlantic slave trade and how black yeah. people protect themselves and exactly. each other from it. I as soon as you were talking, that's exactly where my mind went. It might seem simplistic. Mm -hmm. Um and and obviously very terribly modern. I called someone my play cousin last week, but Again, <laughs> there's something um, very kind of historically grounded, in, you know, in in what Black people do right now. There's never mm -hmm. really not a sort of touch from you know sort of this longer history of. Um, and I think, and I think that there, you know, I there's a there's a way in which, of course the notion of extended kin networks gets mobilized against black communities now very um, powerfully and consistently. Um, I mean, you know, the Moynihan report, then the, yeah. I was thinking know, exactly that. we know the afterlife of this, right? We know the afterlife of the, of the, of the, 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 the mechanisms for producing kin um, that, and how they get uh, filtered in the aftermath of slavery. So I think that we need to spend a little more time thinking about it during um, slavery. And especially, I think, you know, it's, I, I hesitate to, it's easier to see or to imagine that in, the, in a sort of 19th century North American slave society context where birth rates are high enough that families are being formed, like it, we see that, but but I'm trying to argue that that's happening in the 17th century as well, um, and in places that are much more saturated by uh, low low uh, birth rates, by high infant mortality, and and by by the dashing of the hope for futurity. But and yet we still have these moments or these spaces. Right. So we have a, another question um, from an attendee. So can Dr. Morgan talk about how narratives around disability and Blackness attended to the constructs of the market? Hmm. I actually don't know that I can answer that because disability is not something there's, it's not something that I um, tracked in the archive. Um, there, there's no question uh, that, that the that part of what is being constructed in the context of the slave trade is the notion of a value for a whole person. And, and in the Spanish, we have the piece at the end is the notion that there's, there's like a, a, an ideal enslaved laborer. And then there are, uh, you know, there's somebody who is three quarters of a pieza or half of pieza because of age, because of sex, because of disability, right? People who are lame or people who are blinded or people who, who's, whose price literally drops in the market. Um, that I think is foundation. I know that there's, there's a lot of work in critical disability studies that talks about the connection between histories of slavery and history of human valuation in that regard. It's not something that I, paid um, that I was attentive, attentive to in the archive. So I can't really speak to it in the, in the, in the work that I, that I constructed, but I know um, that there are reverberations of that process of valuation uh, that, that speak to, to the valuation and the devaluation of, of an, of an able-bodied person. Yeah, no, absolutely. You're thinking, you know, thinking about like how, you know, able-bodiedness in terms of particularly age, right, and, uh -huh. and the ways in which that gets charted and 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 um, um, uh, accounted for. Um, so we have a question from Benjamin Shearer, uh -huh. um, who asks: Within archival research, what are some examples of methods for reseeing, countering, or uncovering forms of relationality and value that are mostly erased? Hmm.
So, oh, that's, a, I, that's a hard, that's a hard question um, to answer. I, because I'm also, I'm getting stuck on the, our, the which a part of it is erased and which part of it is being constructed. Um, I think that the, the thing that I would, that we were just talking about, about kinship um, is something that the archive does not account for, right? You have to, you have to do the researcher often has to do the work to read between the lines or to elaborate on what it means when a group of people are grouped by in, you know, in what appear to be family groupings and, uh, you know, anybody who's, who's done work in plantation records and knows the, the how that happens. Um, I think that one of the things that uh, actually, Mabel, you talked about it at the very beginning, the, the, um, that piece of evidence we have that there's a female majority in New York City um, shortly after the move from the Dutch to the English among enslaved people. Um, and we know that because of the reports that governors and the tax records that governors are sending back to England. And yet, in the same documents, when there are uprisings or um, or rebellions, uh, enslaved people are simply called Negroes and are are described as all men, uh, which doesn't make demographic sense, nor does it make political sense. And so I think that's an example of the other kind of erasure that the same, the person who is in charge of this very particular kind of counting in one kind of a report is released from that kind of accounting in another kind of report. And I think that that's an, another act of erasure that certainly caught my attention very early on in this process. Thank you for that. I, Natasha, did you want to also respond? No. <laughs> Jennifer's got it. <laughs> okay. So the next question is from our um, colleague and friend, uh, Saidiya Hartman, who asks, oh, who says, first, Jennifer, thank you for your brilliant book. Um, second, can you talk more about the critique of ontological totality in Robinson? I found your engagement very generative. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, um, you know, the all of our work is so, I mean, the fact that I just say the afterlives of slavery now, and I, and I don't even have to, um, I, that we all know what I mean. That's a, that is directly in the wake of Sadia Hartman's brilliant work um, on the archive and on the ways that we think about the history of slavery as being both done and undone. Um, so I think, I think that I am, engaged by the idea of a search for ontological totality like that I am I I, I find that um, I find that idea as as something to recognize that uh, as a as a phenomenon as or as a process as a desire um, for to reconstruct I find that very helpful when I'm when I'm reading these um, art in, in this archive. Um, I think that again when I when I ruminate over the fact that uh, that historians have not presumed that women had um, a kind of theoretics of power uh, when they were confronted with it, um, when they were confronted with the abuse of power in their most intimate lives. Um, I think that what I'm, I'm following in Robinson's wake there, I'm thinking about what does it mean for a woman like Elizabeth Key, again, who I wrote about in, in Partis and I write about a little bit here, to take, to go to court to preserve her freedom uh, in the 1650s in Virginia and that of her children. Um, she's reclaiming a kind of sense of futurity and a sense of possibility using the mechanisms that are available to her. Um, and I think that historians have in the past kind of described her as somebody who's just, who, who something happens, who, as somebody that something has happened to rather than as somebody who makes something happen. Um, and I think that, you know, we have examples of women who walk into courtrooms or who walk into churches and say, I am free, or this child should be free, or 
I need this, you know, I need, I need protection. I need to be able to live uh, my married life in the, in the Spanish archives, you have that. So all of those things, I think, you know, I think that what Robinson is looking for is this moment of collective ontological totality, right, which in, in the Maroon communities, it's very much based in a, in a community. Um, and I think that sometimes the women that we see in these records are isolated, um, and they may very well be isolated in, in their world, but they're certainly isolated in the record. Um, and I think that that's one of the reasons why we kind of fail to see that they're in the process of trying to construct or reconstruct a collective sense of wholeness. Um, so that's that's what ontological totality does for me. I don't know if that answers your question, Professor Hartman, but that's what I got. <laughs> Thank you um, for that. And this, I, I think the following, this following question could be somewhat maybe related to that question. It's related to maybe something I was also interested in, the ways in which financialized, uh, the question disappeared. It said it was nope. answered. Oh, wait. Uh, let me go. It disappeared. What happened? Oh, here it is. OK. Um, the question is um, from Mick. Uh, apologies if, if I <laughs> mangle this. Mikululi uh, Mabusela um, and um, ask, would it be accurate to locate the emergence of speculative trading through from the female slave position as a speculative asset? insofar as she was monetized in terms of prospective yield, her reproductive capacities, and securitized against risk? Because there is a part where you talk about speculative Absolutely. finances. Absolutely. In that. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, you know, I, I, I think that, um, that the idea of, of speculative finance, that, that notion of an investment on the hopes of a certain kind of a return, a kind of financialization, um, which Ian Balcom talks about, but others do as well. That, that I think, again, what I want to do is push that further back in time, right? To say that that's not just an 18th century or an early 19th century phenomenon, but rather um, the, the, the mechanisms of thought that are produced when you have the, I was about to say temerity, but that's not a big enough word, but when you claim to not just own a person, but that person's reproductive future, right? That is an act of financialization and abstraction that is the foundation for modern economies, right? Like it's not, it is, we are very comfortable with a certain kind of speculative finance because we have fully abstracted it. Um, but I would argue that in the context of the rationalizing of slave ownership and of um, of enslavement and of slave trading, all of the speculative pieces um, of financialization that are attached to the slave trade, I think are really important, but certainly the reproductive one is crucial as well. And follow it up just quickly. I think it's so remarkable because it absolutely remains theoretical because we know what happens when women get on board ship and arrive in the Americas and how essentially both the labor regime and the regime of punitive violence makes women literally unfertile. Exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. It's, it's so it's it's all conceptual. It, it, exactly. It has nothing to do with what actually is able to happen with black women's bodies when they get here. Exactly. And that's and that's very it's very important that we were that you know that we constantly are reminded of the fact that all of that that really the experience of labor in the Americas is is an experience of of death and as of the of being exposed to profound um, mortality and and illness and all of that right and so that it is especially in the time period that I'm talking about um, this is not a place in which women are like having children all over the place this is not that's not what's going on and yet the ways in which women appear in the records and in the, 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 the minds of um, slave traders is, it, it centers that reproductive capacity. Thank you. <coughs> um, our next question is um, uh, from Evelyn Laurent Perrault, who has a methodological question. It says, I often struggle with the concept of black radicalism. When we think about the 15th, 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, I do so not because I dismiss the radical visions and decisions of many enslaved women 
and then took, but because I'm aware that many others also did make decisions that had visions and considered the future of their loved ones, but may not fit into the idea of radicalism. So how do you reconcile using radicalism? So I, I, that's a great question and hello, Evelyn. Um, I, uh, I think that part of what I'm asking us to do, um, and again, I think I'm in very good company in asking us to do this, is to reconceptualize the literary and analytic framework in which we have categorized people's behavior, right? I think that there, I don't know what else, what could be more radical than to be a black woman in colonial Virginia who is being held past the legal end of her indenture on the basis of her being black saying, no, I am, you cannot enslave me. I am a servant. My child is free, you know, and, and I mean that, you know, I know that there's a way that we can talk about the use of the courts as being kind of enmeshed in as being not a radical move, but I'm sorry, contextually, I have no problem with thinking about Elizabeth Key as engaging in an act of radicalism because she's asking, she is demanding and she wins. She is demanding recognition of her capacity to act as a free person, right? And to be, and to be rational. Um, and that's in the, in, the, in the worldview in which she is enmeshed, that's an act of radicalism. Is it the same act of radicalism as taking up arms against a, a, you know, a planter regime or of, uh, or of organizing in, in more collective ways uh, a refusal of the plantation regime? Um, it's not the same kind of radicalism, but I think it is radical. Um, I think Marinage is radical, even though I know that maroon communities are often complicit because they're 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 under enormous pressures from the colonial regime um, to compromise and to limit their numbers. And so you get all sorts of like ethnic barriers and people saying, well, no, only a con people can come here or what have you. But by and and yes. But again, the regime in which those communities are trying to survive means it changes what, I don't think we can have an ahistorical, like a, a singular notion of what constitutes radical behavior. And if, 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 if 400 years of, of trading human beings as laborers doesn't teach us that we need to rethink the categories of thought that we've inherited as a result of those 400 years, then I don't know what does, right? Like, so that's, that's what, that's, that's what I think about radicalism. I'm not uncomfortable with it. <laughs> great. So I think we have two more questions. So, okay. um, so I think we're, we're great. So this is from Jewel Thim. Um, it says, Dr. Morgan, in a recent reading for Professor Lightwood's class, it was mentioned that there is some evidence in the archive of enslaved people who were traders, who were traders were unable to sell at a profit due to their madness. This reminded me of your mention of immense grief witnessed by traders as slaves were divided into rational units. What evidence, if any, did you uncover of madness or visible sadness as a form of resistance to the slave trade? And thanks for your work. Okay, thank you so much for the question. I So I was, I knew I had an answer for you right up until you said as a form of resistance to the slave trade. So what I know is that there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of evidence of, of there's a lot of um, association of madness with death aboard slave ships in the hands of slave traders who write about, um, there's this, uh, there's this, passage in which a slave trader talks about a woman um, who gave birth to a child and then the, and then the child died, but she carried that child until she died of grief, right? And I, it's hard for me to, like, it's, I, so that, I don't want to situate that into a framework of resistance. I want to situate that into the framework of grief, but of course, I know there's a way to think about her as someone who, who, whose grief was like a profound act of refusal, right? Like, I'm going to refuse to relinquish this child. I'm going to refuse to, 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 to survive this journey, right? Like, I'm not going to do it. Um, I think that there's, in the, 
in the plantation records, there is a lot of accusation. This is an example that historians of medicine and, and um, historians of the body have, have done a lot of really careful work on. It's like one of the things that planters always do is they accuse enslaved people of like of feigning illness or feigning madness um, and, and as a way to get out of work. Um, and so that's another example of the, you know, you have to do a lot of reading around that to arrive at the, at, to arrive at a conclusion. Like what is the difference between, um, between actually being driven mad by, in, by slavery, which should have, which drove some people mad because it's insane. Um, and, and taking on the characteristics of madness as a way to push back against that regime, right? Like, I think that there's some ethical and uh, empirical questions there that we just have to sit with for a while. Um, so I don't, so that's a sort of answer to your question, but not entirely. Great, um, and there's a comment, um, but I'm actually gonna just, uh, get to this, oh, somebody dumped a new question, but we, I don't think we'll have time to get to it. Um, this is from Jackie Lombard. Thank you so much for this fantastic conversation, Dr. Morgan. I appreciate it, your preface. As a reading of the portrait you've chosen as your cover, could you speak more about how images like this or of Katharina or other anonymous black women from the period have informed your research and in turn, how your work is an archive that shaped the approach how your work in the archive has shaped your approach yeah. to these images. I mean, I'm really following in the wake of um, Kim Hall's work on uh, material culture in England and the way that Black uh, people appear in portraits. Um, and I'm also a, an enormous beneficiary of, of being Deb Willis's colleague and having been able to participate in a number of, um, of conferences and, and gatherings of, 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 from art historians and other people who work in visual culture uh, to talk about the history of portraiture and the, in the history of Black people in Western art. So I don't think that I'm making a contribution to that to that field in this moment. Rather, I think that I'm the recipient of those critical uh, scholars um, who've taught me, first of all, that there are a lot of Black people in European portraiture, um, that, that you just, you know, just walk through the museum and they're, you know, it, and, and, that, and that as a, in that quick aside, that often those people are in the portrait in order to highlight the whiteness of the person at the center of the gaze, right? But there are also many examples in which a person's presence like this woman is captured by the painter. Like there's this, there's something so uh, alive in her face and that conveys such a strong sense of inner life um, and that's the piece that I think I want to take from that portrait, which is to say, this is not a woman who is passively accepting, you know, like, she's not passive in any way. And some of that has to do with the skill of the painter, but some of that has to do with, with his ability to capture something about who she is. So turn to some of those scholars for more on, I mean, there, again, this is a, there's so many areas of like vibrant growth uh, in, in studies that connect to, um, to the Black Atlantic, to the field of the African diaspora, et cetera. Um, I feel like I'm just the beneficiary of that. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the cover and just your reading of it, you know, as somebody who does work on material culture and art, I mean, it was really extraordinary because also even within art, hist art, art, art history and visual cultural analysis, you know, the way in which that clearly linked up to the, the market and the way in which you talked about valuation and slavery and the fact that most people don't realize there were there were lots of blacks in Europe in this period mm -hmm. all over Italy France you know and, and you know and they do they appear in paintings in many many different guises right yeah. and so what they mean the allegories that are, that 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 are entered into those paintings around marking time about marking status you know complicates the ways in which we understand you know. Mm -hmm. Um, black lives in this period. And I think if I can just say one final thing, like I think that because of the, you know, there's a, we're situated as, uh, as you know, looking at uh, art in that way, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, and so that gesture by which the 
people, those black people in early modern Europe get kind of reduced in the portrait um, is one that you have to work really um, actively against to say, okay, like, what do I, you know, granting that this is a piece of art that's constructed by a white painter, et cetera, like, what can I learn about, um, about, what can I, what questions can I learn to ask about inner life uh, by, with the help of this kind of work, this kind of, these kinds of images, this kind of material culture. I think that's the main thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's 8.01, uh, so we are ending, but I just want to thank you both for a really wonderful and informative discussion on, on Jennifer's really important historiographic recalibration. I mean, it's an incredible intellectual con contribution really to how we understand the lies of those enmeshed in this, you know, this kind of brutal foundational system, right, um, of the transatlantic slave trade and what it also means for us today. Um, I also wanna say a special thanks to our intrepid staff, Sean Mendoza, and also Sharon Harris, who keeps these events on time, the chat moving, and everyone on track. And I wanna thank the audience for your insightful questions um, and attending this evening's conversation. Next week, we actually have two events that are upcoming on Tuesday, September 21st, mark your calendars at 6.30. Join us for conversations with our own Farrah Griffin about her new really incredible book, Read Until You Understand, The Profound Wisdom of Black Life. Um, joining Farrah, uh, I think it's Black Life and Literature, somehow I think I cut that off. Joining Farrah will be Yale professor, uh, uh, Dr. Daphne Brooks and Rutgers professor, Dr. Imani Owen. So I think that will be great. And then following that on Thursday, on the 23rd of September at 6.30 is Dr. Tobias Wolford of Virginia Commonwealth University, who will give a lecture, Passing Fantasies at the Borders of Race and Belonging in African-American Art, co-sponsored by uh, uh, Department of Art History here at Columbia. So those two events are there. For more information, please see our website, um, afamstudies.columbia.edu, which has been in the chat. So. Thank you. Um, take care and be well. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Uh, it's just really great. It's wonderful. Thank you. Bye.